And now we take you to Evangel Church in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Good morning, Evangel. We are so glad to have you here this morning. Uh, My name is Andrea, and it's just an honor and privilege to share with you guys this morning on one of our core values. We're going to do a brief little recap. If you haven't been able to see all of the sermon series starting at the beginning of January, I encourage you guys to go back. This is a 12-week series. We started it off on week one with our core verse, and it's this. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and it says, Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. So in week one, we learned that our new vision statement is leading people into a transforming relationship with Jesus. We don't want to just... have church to have church, but we want to introduce people to the one that can transform their lives, and that's our Savior. We went into our our four um, uh, vision statement points, which is knowing God, finding freedom, discovering purpose, and making a difference. And then after that was over, we started to kind of unpack some core values. These are things that Ryan and I ourselves in our own personal life have really tried to adapt to. Now, some of these come easier than not. So there are things in, in my life with, with who I am and how God wired me that, that this comes a little easier. There are things that I have to work at with. And so our core values use our love. We love everyone because Jesus loved everyone. We believe in personal growth, that we allow God to change us because growing things change. I, I have struggle with change. This is one of the things that I like to know exactly what's going to happen that morning when I wake up. I like to have my, or I have my plan for the week. And, and so in order for me to allow things to change and adapt in my life, it's a little bit more difficult transparency. We let people in and choose to live life without the mask. Last week, Ryan talked about generosity. We live life with an open hand rather than a closed fist. And then we, and the first one was excellence. We give our best because God gave his best. This week is passion. I have to be honest. This is one that comes pretty easily for me. I love to have fun. I love it. I love to laugh. I love to enjoy life. It's just something that I've done even since I was a little kid. You can ask my parents, who my dad is retiring next week. Yay! His his, uh, retirement service, 51 years in ministry is next week. But you can ask them. They had to tell me to settle down all the time. Andrea, just settle down. Settle down. Just just be still. Settle down. I had ADHD before it became popular, and doctors started giving medication for it. That was me. And I would pick the worst times to be hyperactive because I would do it in church. Now, listen, there's a reason why I sit over here all by myself, because the minute somebody sits next to me, I start to talk to them, and I, and I make faces and, and all that. When COVID first hit and we first went back into service in, um, uh, up in Washington, we were sitting down and I don't know what came over me, but uh, you have to sit with your family, right? And so at that point, just, and so um, I had Jordan on this side and Jeremiah on this side, and I think Journey was running a camera. And so we're sitting there and Ryan tells us all to bow our heads and close our eyes. And what had happened was, you know, those real big masks, the one that nobody could find, the painter's masks, we had like a stack of those in our garage. And so I was passing those out. We put initials on them because Ryan's a German germaphobe, and so we put initials on them. And so Jordan had, she's sitting next to me, she has this big oh, N95, I don't know, mask on her face. And when he said, bow your head and close your eyes, I, I don't know what came over me. I just looked at her, and I grabbed the mask, and I pulled it back, and I snapped it back onto her face. And uh, I mean, this is in the middle of church, and at that point, Ryan's like, you cannot sit next to anyone. You are 44 years old. There is something inside of me that I just like to have fun. I love to have fun and be passionate about what I do. You know, Solomon tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes that there's a time for everything. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to laugh. 
And, and friends, we're going to read some, some passages of scripture here from our Savior. He was passionate about what he did. He loved people, right? He was transparent, but he was moved with passion and compassion for people that the action that he had wasn't, wasn't boring, but it was full of zeal. That when miracles happened, there was something inside of him that he had a zeal about him to help other people. And in order for us to live our life, we have to have fun. We have to enjoy it. And so as we look at this and as we look at these fun times and things that we do, and I'm going to tell some stories throughout because I want you to laugh today. I want you to enjoy yourself at, of just some things that I, and I've come to find out as I was going through this, a lot of the fun things that I do involve um, not torturing my kids, but doing something to my kids that I feel like is funny and they don't feel like is funny. Like for instance, this, um, this past week was spring break. And so I just had this thought at eight o'clock in the morning that my 17 year old son needs a hug because why wouldn't you hug a 17 year old at 8.30 in the morning on spring break? So of course I don't just hug him. I jump onto the bed, right? And we're at my parents' house. And so I jump onto the bed and I wrap my arms around him. And I said, son, did you know there's a study that says if you hug every day, you live longer. Don't you want your mother to live? Don't you want me to live? And he's like, get off of me, mom. Get off. And I'm just loving on him. And so I come into the living room and Ryan's sitting there drinking his coffee. He's like, what did you just do? I'm like, oh, there was a study that said if you hug more, that you live longer. You should go hug Jeremiah. So you know what he did? He put his coffee down and he walked right into the room. He's like, what's going on? And his son, I love you. you. You need to have fun and enjoy. And if it's at the expense of your children, it's okay. God, God is okay with that. He knows that, he, that they kept you up all night. So he's fine with that. You know, there was a New Year's resolution that was done in 2016. And when they were asked what they would want to do, the, the most important, you know, losing weight, getting healthy, all of these um, things available for New Year's list, the highest one by 45% was to enjoy life to the fullest. And I do have to say, we live in a culture, especially for our young people, that depression is running rampant in our young people that we have to learn and find a way for us to enjoy the presence of the Lord and enjoy the life that our Savior died to give us. So as you do this, open up your Bibles with me to John 10.10 because 10. we want to look at something that Jesus said, what the enemy comes to do, and what he has come to give us. One of the things that my dad told me growing up with my, my zeal for life and, and loving to have fun, besides telling me to calm down and settle down and not to sit next to anyone in church, but he also told me, he said, Andrea, don't ever let the enemy steal your joy. It's something that has come natural for me, but I've worked very hard to keep it. Because there have been moments and times in my life where I could have allowed the enemy to take my joy. And it's so important for us to understand that scripture tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. In order for us to succeed in this life, we have to have the joy of the Lord. That, that part of us that's not just happy and not just content, but is passionate. That is, the, when he gives us a task to do, that we do it full of life. John 10.10 10 says this in the um, ESV version. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And I, I would say that to those of you that are watching online, to those of you that are sitting here, all of our young people, and I know we've got a lot out right now with um, spring break, but the enemy is coming after our young people to steal and kill and destroy them. And it's important that we draw a line in the sand and let this next generation know that what you're feeling and what you're sensing, that's from Satan, that we have an enemy and that he is coming after us to steal and kill and destroy our lives. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it 
more abundantly. In order for us to have not a perfect life, but an abundant life, we have that life in Christ. So there are five things that we want to go over this morning that will kill our passion. And I think it's important for us to know this and to recognize this. Because it's, it's more than just saying, okay, Jesus, you said that you have come, that we, and we're going to back everything up by scripture. You have come that I may have life and have it abundantly. How do I do that? A lot of the times we have to look at our life and take, um, take an idea of what's in our life and maybe remove some things that we have allowed the enemy to bring in that has just become complacent. And I'm not talking about social media, although, hmm, listen, I, my, my kids went, uh, we watched this um, documentary called Social Dilemma, and I mean, it's eye-opening what social media does to our brains and to our young people. And I, we, we started halfway through it and we brought our kids in and we were like, you've got to watch this. M- my daughter, Jordan, put down Instagram for like three weeks. It, it, it rocked her so badly that this was happening. And so I, it, it's a really, it's understanding what we're allowing to come into our mind. And we're going to talk about that. But the first thing that kills our passion, one of the ways that we become um, passionless is that we lack margin. So that's number one. We lack margin. And here's what I mean by margin. That you have no time to rest and recover. In scripture, it's called a Sabbath. It's a day of rest. See, the Lord wrote that in scripture for us. He knew we could not go 100 miles an hour without stopping and taking a breath. In fact, taking a breath, Maya Angelou says this, life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but the moments that take our breath away. That lack of margin, that's that breath. That Sabbath is that rest, that breath. That we take that, and and scripture says that we take it once a week. That we take a moment and we rest. It's so important for us and for our bodies and for our minds. I've been reading through the Old Testament this year, and I'm in Deuteronomy, and there are so many festivals There are so many parties. Like God has it set in the Jewish calendar. Like you got to party here and you got to rejoice here and you got to be grateful here. Now here you got to work really hard. But then once you get done working, you know what you get to do? You get to have another party. And I love that his parties include food. We have to have margin in our life. We have to take those moments and rest. The psalmist says this in Psalm 127.2, it is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing you will starve to death, for God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. To rest, have margin, have that moment where it's okay that you don't answer the phone. It's probably a telemarketer anyway. Although I do have stories about that. I enjoy that. That's one of the things I enjoy is answering those phone calls. So, um, and, and can I be transparent? This is something that Ryan and I work on consistently. This is something that does not come easy. Uh, uh, margin does not come easy for us. I want to be a hands-on mom. I want to be at every sporting event. Well, when you have three kids that have three sporting events on the same day, that gets really busy. And we work very hard. We, we are passionate about what we do. We, you know, I, I think there are times when Ryan has sent an email at 6.30 in the morning and 10 o'clock at night to the same person. I'm like, they don't want to hear from you that early. Oh, they can answer it later. You know, I, we work very hard. And so this is something that we have learned to take those Sabbaths, to take those moments where we catch our breath. And we have those moments where we sit, listen, we sit before the Lord, we, we, you know, we take a nap, you know, there's a part of scripture, right, in Psalms where he says, he makes, a, he makes us lay down in green pastures, he restores our soul. Sometimes we just need a nap. First Timothy 4, 7 says, spend your time and energy in the exercise of keeping spiritually fit. 
One of the ways that we have to have margin in our life is to, re- to understand that we have to have balance. And with that balance comes being spiritually fit, that we read his word every day, that we take a moment and we turn everything off every day and we meditate on his word. It's, it's, it's restful. It's, it's regenerating. It's what we talked about, that that's how we get transformed, by renewing our minds. And we have gotten away from that in this fast-paced life that we live. I wake up at 5.30 every morning. The alarm still goes off, but I, I wake up before it or at it. And I sit down with a cup of coffee and my, and my iPad, because I, I, um, I have a Bible too, but I read on my iPad. I turn all of my notifications off. And I sit first thing in the morning and I meditate on the word of God. It's a moment of breath. It's a moment of rest. It's a moment to feed my soul and to put that margin in my life. Because I'm telling you, I'm not going to be passionate about life if I'm exhausted. We will not be passionate about what God, and we won't do it well if we're not rested. The second thing, the second passion killer is this. It's a secret sin. A secret sin. Now, this one, this one's going to be a little bit hard because can I tell you, we all struggle. We all fall short of his amazing glory. And more times than not, in those 5.30 in the morning moments with the Lord. Now, if 5.30 isn't your time, It's not his time. I'm the only one up at 5.30, right? He's the last one to bed. I'm the first one up. Find your time to rest. But in those moments, those have been the moments where the Holy Spirit, and, and in the Greek, that spirit means wind, that fresh breath of wind, comes into my living room and speaks to my soul and to my spirit and says, this isn't right this part of your life, this isn't pleasing to me. Those secret sins in our life, they will weigh us down. There is a freedom in repentance. And I don't know why we as a church, and I don't mean this church, but globally as a church, we have gotten away from calling things a sin. We have gotten away from it, and I know it's been used and abused to try to beat us into a behavior pattern. But there comes a moment where we personally have to take responsibility for our walk with Christ, open up his word, and allow his word to cleanse us. Psalm 38, 4 says this, my guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. The weighing down that the enemy brings, how he steals and kills and destroys us, is he tells us, don't tell anybody about that. Don't tell anybody about that sin because they'll look at you different. When he knows for a fact that when we confess our sins one to another, that there is a freedom and a lifting of the burden that happens that's placed on our shoulders. That when we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins. It is not something that we should shy away from as a body of Christ, but instead we should embrace it and say that this is a place where we can be okay, that we're not okay, and we can be real and transparent. Now listen, don't tell everybody, right? Because you don't, find the person. Find the person, and we're going to talk about this surrounding yourselves with friends, and we talked about this with the youth, but find your person that you can share the things that are, you're struggling with, the sins that are tripping you up over and over, that are weighing you down, that's removing your passion. Share them and allow the Lord to forgive you and be free. John, 1 John 1, 9 says this, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. I love that. It's like a it's like a do-over. It's a fresh start. That he forgives us and he cleanses us. 
The next one, and, and the third passion killer is this, and it's unforgiveness. I know we talked about this at the end of the year, and uh, the last service, the last Sunday of the year, we, we, we talked about this, about unforgiveness. And I think this is the place that the enemy for me has really tried his hardest to remove my joy and my passion for not just following him, but serving my brothers and sisters in Christ. I, mean, I, I, I shared with you that growing up as a pastor's kid, all eyes were on me. And so it was very difficult to navigate that as a pastor's kid and to feel some judgments and not walk in unforgiveness. But I, I can tell you this, the thing that will steal your joy and your passion quicker is having unforgiveness and judgmentalness and criticalness to someone else. Ephesians 4, 31 says this, and, and I want you to hear this. I, I want us to sit here for just a second because we have to be able to see the stark contrast of what culture is right now and who we are supposed to be at, as a church, as a body of believers. If nothing else in this day and age, this should ring so true and real to us. Stop being mean, bad-tempered and angry, Quarreling, harsh words, and dislike of others should have no place in your lives. Do you feel it in our nation? Do you feel it in our world? The anger and the hatred that is being spewed out. Quarreling and harsh words and dislike for others. We're supposed to love. Listen. We will call sin, sin, but we will love the sinner. And if we don't love those that are struggling, then we are not like Christ because he ate with the prostitutes. And he looked at the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery and he said, where are your accusers? She said, Lord, they're gone. He said, I don't accuse you either. What does he say? Go and sin no more. In that moment, he loved, he had compassion, and he was real. And for us as a body of believers, we have to stop being mean. We are moved with compassion and with passion for each other. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you because you belong to Christ. Forgiveness is truly the cornerstone of our faith. He forgave us, so we forgive others. And this morning, you, could have, you can walk through these doors and have unforgiveness in your heart to somebody, but please don't leave here. Listen, this week, something happened this week and it triggered something in me and I was like, you know what? I could hold on to that. I, I literally, and I went down the road. I could hold on to that and become, I, I, I saw myself walking down the road of unforgiveness, cutting people out of my life, right? I, I, I don't have to talk to them anymore. I, I just, I, I found myself and I was like, no, 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 wait, hold up. He forgave me of so much. I will forgive others for the very little. For a harsh word spoken or a, a look that maybe for me it was offensive. They probably didn't even mean it. But I will choose to forgive because I know if I belong to Christ, that's what I'm supposed to do. The next one, the fourth passion killer is this, it's toxic friendships. We talked about this in youth a lot. Surrounding yourself with people that now, I'm going to say this, I am not one of those us four and no more. Like every single person in this place, we are friends, I love you. Now I may not tell you all my business, but 
believe me, I have around me a group of women and family members that are allowed to speak into my life and say, you know what, Andrea, that right there does not line up to the word of God. And toxic friends won't do that. Toxic friends will let you stay in your mess because they want you to be bound because they want to hold something over you. See, we don't think of it that way, but that's the truth. It's a way of manipulation and control. So who are you spending your most time with? Are they kind and gentle people? Are they forgiving? Are they supportive of you and who God made you to be? Do they assume the best in people or are they manipulative? Do they hold grudges and try to get you to pick up their offenses? Do they tear you down and others? And do they speak negatively about others and lift themselves up? Now, listen, guys, there is, for, for me personally, I was never the popular kid in school. That was just never something that I... You know, I, I probably was too hyper for that. They were like, <laughs> settle down. Like, I mean, everyone had to tell me to settle down, even, you know, on the basketball team. Just settle down. It'll be okay. Just calm down. So I was probably a, a little annoying at moments. Okay, I, I still think it's funny that God put Ryan and I together. <laughs> because we, I, anybody will ever watch Winnie the Pooh? Okay, there are two characters on there that Ryan and I both identify with, <laughs> and it's not Pooh. Um, see, one of them loses its tail, and everything's blue. That would be him. <laughs> and then there's this other one that comes bouncing in on their tail, <laughs> And that's Tigger. And I just, I love life, and I'm running circles around him at 5.30 in the morning, like, hey, what are we going to do today? Let's go do something fun. You want to go do something fun? No. He doesn't want to do anything fun. He just wants to rest, but that's okay. He's a good sport, and we've worked this out together. Do you have people surrounding your life that speak negatively? It is not us for and no more. And if you have someone that's consistently consistently speaking negatively about other people. Friend, let me tell you, those that speak negatively about others to you speak about you to others. Don't think that they're holding in what they think about you when they get around other people. If they're talking to you about others, they will talk about you to others. We surround ourselves with people, not that puff us up and inc just encourage us, but correct us, but aren't tearing other people down. But if we are going to be the body of Christ, we encourage one another and build up one another. When we surround ourselves with toxic people, it kills our passion. Have you ever been around somebody so negative that you don't want to do anything? Because you know that if you say, I'm, I want to do this, they're going to pick it apart and tell you why you can't do it. And so then you just stop saying what you want to do because it's going to be picked apart. Listen, either tell them to stop or find a new friend. Hebrews 10.25, let us think of ways to motivate each other to acts of love and good work. I want to motivate you because I want you to motivate me to reach this community, that we will reach it with a zeal and with a passion. Surrounding ourselves and becoming a church, that we are passionate about what we do. We enjoy what we do. We have fun doing it. There is a zeal that we hold. And the fifth one is this, the lack of purpose. The Bible says that without a vision, the people perish. Listen, the reason why we have this vision statement on the wall of leading people to a transforming relationship with Jesus isn't just to have a catchy phrase. It's so we have a purpose. We're all united. This is what we do. Because without a vision, the people perish. God created us to have a vision and to have a passion for our life, a focus for our life, that this is what we do. 
So when I wake up in the morning, I want to lead myself into a transforming relationship with Jesus. I want to lead my children, and it's hard leading three teenagers to a transforming relationship with Jesus, but that's my purpose. When I come here into the office, I'm wanting to lead people. When I'm at the grocery store, I want to be kind and speak words of encouragement to the people around me, so that way, if by chance, they like, what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor and to lead them into a transforming relationship with Jesus. But if we lack a purpose, we will have no passion. Isaiah 49.4 says, I replied, but my work seems useless. I've spent my strength to do nothing and to no purpose. Isaiah was looking around and he felt like nothing was working. When we feel like it's, passionless, we need, to un- we need to reevaluate and see if it has significance and meaning. Howard Thurman, an author, writer, and theologian said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. People who have come alive in Christ. That's what this world needs. They need people who are passionate about their Savior, passionate about what they believe. And I love this in Romans chapter 12, verse 11. It says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Wes, if you wouldn't mind coming on up. The word keep there insinuates that we have to work at it. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. So we talked about the five things that kill our passion. And maybe as I was saying those, the Holy Spirit spoke that there's some things in your life that you can change. But let me, let me give you two ways to reconnect to a spiritual fervor with God. Scripture says he'd rather us be hot or cold. But when we become that lukewarm, how do we reignite the passion? I know, I know this. I, I got saved when I was five years old. So this summer, it'll be 40 years. I got saved at, at five for 40 years. And, and I, I, I heard Ryan earlier There have been moments where it's become very mundane, but not because of him, but because of me. There have been moments in my life where I've taken for granted the amazing power and love that I once had for my Savior, that I once had for his word. I can tell you, 2020 rocked me to a place that there is a new passion and a new fervor. When everything gets stripped away, something happens. It reignites something inside of you. And so one of the ways that we can keep our spiritual fervor is maintain our connection with God. This is one of our favorite verses that Ryan and I Uh, have. It was very meaningful for us back in 2019. We were given a book by Andrew Murray, and it's called Abiding in Christ. It's a 30-day devotional, but it takes longer than 30 days to get through it, I can tell you that much. But it talks about John 15, where it says this in John 15, 4 and 5, remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The first step to come back to a passion with your Savior is to abide in him to get reconnected to the vine. See, friends, we're just a branch. That's all we are. He's the life giver. He's the vine. He produces the fruit. He's the one that sustains us. 
And there was a moment in 2019 where Ryan and I, our, our marriage was fine and, and, our, and we were doing the work of the Lord, but we were, we were drained. We were so drained and empty. There was no passion for serving. We still did it. Don't get me wrong. But there was nothing left in us. Someone handed us this book and pointed us to a verse of scripture that we had read hundreds of times. And it clicked. We had been doing good work without being connected to him. And something changed inside of us in November of 2019. It was a moment in our life where the Lord began to re-spark that fervor and that passion for him and for serving. That we no longer gave what we could give, but we allowed him to produce fruit. In order for you to get back to a passion with Jesus, it is so important that we get reconnected to who he is. One of the things that, that I, and this isn't in my notes, but one of the things, that, reading through scripture, and, and I, I shared with this with you guys earlier, the, one of the things I found reading through the Bible chronologically this year is how many times God's people failed. And he was there. How many times that Joshua got scared and God spoke to him. And one of the things that I'm looking and I'm seeing in here in, in, in Scripture, it's just opening up my eyes. Like I said, I've been, I've been saved for 40 years. So I probably knew this about 20 years ago, but I need to be refreshed. You know, I'm sure somebody preached this and I was like, oh, that was good. But now it's in my heart that time after time, when Joshua got scared or Isaiah got scared and God came to him and said, do not be afraid, be courageous, do not be afraid, be courageous. He didn't say, because you can do it. He didn't affirm the person. He affirmed himself. He said, be strong and courageous because I am with you. And I want to know who I am in Christ. I'm not saying that. But more than that, I want to know who he is. Because I have limitations and he does not. And when I'm connected to the vine and I allow him to affirm himself to me, it's no longer about me. It's about what he can do. He's all powerful. He's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He follows me to the depths of hell and onto the mountaintop. He is there. In order for us to reignite a passion, we have to know who our God is. Who do we serve? We serve the creator of the universe, the one who knitted us together in our mother's womb, that knew our name, before we were born, he knew us because he's great. The second way that we can re reignite our passion is to be a part of something bigger than yourself. In this selfie world, in this selfie culture that we've created, let's be a part of something bigger than self. Let's be about the Father's business, because that's what Jesus did. He said, oh, I, I'm just here, because I'm about the Father's business. A few years ago, we did a fall fest, and we're getting ready to do Easter and to have an Easter egg hunt here on campus, and I know it's going to be different than the community outreach that we normally do, and, but those moments that we have to serve not just fulfills something in the community, but it reignites a passion inside of us. 
And so a few years ago, Journey, we were in a fall fest and all the kids were serving and I was tucking Journey in bed that night. I think she was about 10 years old, 11 years old. And I was tucking her in bed and she goes, oh, mom, I'm so happy. Now we were exhausted, right? Decorations, all the things that we did for weeks at, you know, up to this huge community outreach. I think we had over 500 kids that year or maybe more. I don't, I don't know. And I said, well, why are you so happy? And she said, I saw a little girl, she won a prize. And she turned around and she was so happy and she said, it made my heart happy. In order for us to have passion, it's gotta be about somebody else. It has to be about others. This morning as we close, I just want you to take a moment. Maybe this morning you've struggled. You've struggled with your passion with the Lord. That's, a, that's okay. It happens. Don't leave this place that way. God is providing us a moment and an atmosphere to allow the Holy Spirit to reignite a flame and a fire. Listen, working with these young people have opened my eyes. They need to see the miracle working power of the Holy Spirit. They need to see the passion and fire that came down on Pentecost. In order for them to, ma- to navigate this world, they need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But friend, so do we. Ryan and I believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to pour out on this church. But friends, it doesn't start in our seats. It starts in our heart. That we open up our heart and say, clean it out. Clean it out. I become complacent. I haven't prayed with the passion that I used to pray with. I haven't interceded for others. I haven't served the way I used to. I haven't been nice. I've been mean. Whatever the Holy Spirit begins to tell you that you need to forgive, that you need to find new friends, surround yourself with people who are going to encourage you in the Lord, whatever that is, allow the Holy Spirit right now to begin to fan that flame that used to burn so brightly that the love of Christ could not be held in so that this next generation can see men and women who practice what they preach. This morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you today, no shame in the game. No shame in this. If that's you this morning and you need a brand new passion for the Lord, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bold. I want you to stand. Stand right where you are. If you need a new passion for the Lord, stand right where you are and lift your hands. Lift your hands before the Lord, and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to fan the flame that has gone dead in him, to reignite us and reposition us into the vine, the only one that can produce fruit for us. Holy Spirit, we ask this morning that your power and your miracle working power be felt in this place that we would sense you not just close and near, but set us on fire, that we won't walk through this life in a mundane way, but we will be passionate about what you've called us to do, that we will be passionate about reaching this next generation in Jesus' name. Now, Heavenly Father, for those that have their hands lifted, refill us. Refill us, Lord. Fill us up to overflowing. Forgive us of our sins that so easily trip us up and set our hearts ablaze for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. 
We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel's all about making the name of Jesus famous and His church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.